Nations from every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory, every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship you will be exalted, O God, and your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship you will be exalted, O God. And your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing to the ancient of days. For none can compare to your matchless worth. Sing to the ancient of days. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing to the ancient of days. For none can compare to your matchless worth. Sing to the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship you will be exalted, O God. And your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days. 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 Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Oh, my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Soul, I'll worship your holy name. And on that day, when my strength is failing, the end draws near, and my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. 
Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I'll worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I'll worship Your holy name. I'll worship your holy name. I'll worship your holy name. Blessed Jesus, come to me. Soothe my soul with rays of peace. As I look to you, alone. Fill me with your love. Mountains high or valleys low, you will never let me go. By your fountain let me drink, fill my thirsty soul. Glorious, marvelous, grace that rescued me. Holy, worthy is the Lamb who died for me. Blessed Jesus, come to me as I fall. Touch your nail scarred hands, Jesus, I would see. Glorious, marvelous, grace that rescued me. There's nowhere else that I'd rather be 
than dancing with you as you sing over me. There's nothing else that I'd rather do, Lord, than to worship you. So rejoice, be glad, rejoice, O oh my soul, for the Lord, your God, he reigns forevermore, I rejoice, for my God reigns. So rejoice, be glad, your father and your friend is the Lord, your God, whose rule will never end, I rejoice, for my God reigns, my God reigns, and I dance the dance of praise, my God reigns, with a shout I will proclaim, my God reigns, and I worship without shame. My God reigns, and I will rejoice, for my God reigns, and I will rejoice, for my God reigns. Good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Saturn Road. This, this morning is uh, not only National Dictionary Day, or National Learn a Word Day, it's Harvest Sunday. It's our annual time of the year to get together and, and bring our gifts and support the many international uh, and local works uh, and missions. And uh, we are so happy for that. We are so glad that you're here today on Harvest Sunday. Um, our message and our theme today will be centered around missions. As you can see, all the flags that are around the auditorium, 
these are all of our works that we either sponsor or support across the globe. Uh, so there are many, many different works that we, that we, do, we do. There was a couple of baptisms uh, I want to mention from this week. Camaletta Thomas uh, was baptized on Wednesday night. She's not actually here today, but uh, I wanted to mention that she listened to the message last week, uh, received the word, and she studied with Mark Maynard and Daniel Morgan on Wednesday and she was baptized Wednesday night. So, <laughs> praise God. Yeah, she is, she's working today. She's in home health, and, uh, but she will be here on Wednesday. So if you're here Wednesday, please give Camaletta a hug. Uh, also, um, I believe I saw on social media that Bennett Bell was baptized either yesterday or the day before. So. Uh, he's one of our, in our youth group, our junior high, so if you see Bennett, uh, give him a hug as well, okay? One plug for the, um, the fall festival this coming Saturday, I uh, wanted to mention. So, this is a three-pound bag of candy. I think it serves three kids. <laughs> so... If you have the opportunity this week to bring a bag of candy on Wednesday or Amazon ships candy. So if you'd like to ship a bag of candy, I'm sure Jeanette Clothier would love to fill up her office with bags of candy. But the fall festival is this coming Saturday. Oh, is it next Saturday? Okay, I'm a week early. So it is next Saturday, but they are looking for many volunteers. So if, if you're able to volunteer uh, for that event, please uh, get with the children's ministry and sign up for that. So uh, again, we're so happy that you're here. We um, also, for those that are attending online, uh, thank you for that. And also for our visitors, so happy to have you. We're gonna uh, take a moment right now to have Hug and Howdy. And if you see someone that, that you, you know, haven't talked to in a while, shake their hand and give them a hug. Let's stand and do that.
Now that we've greeted and gotten to know our neighbors in the pew next to you, it's time to get to know a young family this morning. And if you don't know them yet, I want to introduce you to Colin James Baker. We're about to put a picture up on the screen. There he is. Baker family, why don't you come on down? Proud parents are Garrison and Paige. And we have extended family joining us here today. If you guys would please stand so we can recognize you as well. They're going to join us on the stage. Their mentor family, who will be walking alongside them and praying with them as he grows, are Jason and Diane Wilhite. If you would, please make your way down to the stage as well. Hello, guys. Hi. Well, today is another day to praise God because he has fearfully and wonderfully made Colin James Baker. In this blessing, Bakers, not only are you dedicating your son to the Lord, but also yourselves as parents. And we take this opportunity as a congregation to get to know this family in particular and pledge ourselves as prayer partners as he grows and matures in Christ. So now in response to all God has given you, will you bring up Colin in a loving and nurturing home with Christ at its center and nourish him with the instruction and admonition of the Lord? If you will, in front of all these people, say, we will. Wonderful. Church, it's your turn. Please stand. Church, we care for and support these parents as they help him to grow, offering prayer and encouragement that Colin may grow in Christ's strength and maturity. If you will, as a church, say, we will. We will. Wonderful. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of Colin. His name means victory of, the, victory of the people. And so we pray his life points to you, our ultimate victor and redeemer of the people. May he grow into a boy and a man confident that you have won over sin and death. May he follow your lead and lift up the downtrodden and those oppressed by sin. And may his very life testify that we have victory in you. As James, may he turn the world on its head. May he be a supplanter by bringing your grace and truth where there is decay and sorrow. May he usher in your light in the dark places of this world, and may his life replace withering hatred with your fierce love. In the loving name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Love you guys. Thank you. Good morning. Our theme for Harvest Sunday is the verse in Romans, the 10th chapter, verse 15, on the plaque behind me. It says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But it also has a prefix to that statement, and it says, as it is written, which means that it was written somewhere. It is found in Isaiah, the 52nd chapter, verse 7, where it says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good tidings or good news. The Old Testament verse has a background to it that I think will be interesting to you. From time to time, cities and regions went to war with each other. Each city or village would send a watcher along with the soldiers that went out from that city. They would find the valley where the battle would be fought, and then they would find a high place, either a mountain or a hill nearby, and go to that place where they could overlook the battle and see how it would go. The person that was sent out by the city or the village would be the fastest runner, but also the one that could run a long distance. When the two armies would meet, they would usually form a V, and the top of the V would be trained soldiers. The rest of the V would be farm boys, 
many of which did not have swords or spears to fight with. Maybe they've brought a sickle from the farm or a club to fight with. As the battle would join, the watcher would watch carefully to see which V penetrated the other V and watch to see the farm boys because the farm boys, when they would see the soldiers in front of them fall, would usually turn and run for mama. When the watcher would see this, they knew it was time for them to go to their village and warn the people and tell people how the battle was going. The two armies would then chase after each other. The farm boys would run as fast as they could, but the watcher was a trained runner, and he would run not on roads because they didn't have paved roads back then. If it was gravel, that was probably good, but there was very little of that. Much of it was just across the open country where there were thorns and thistles, rocks. They had no Nike shoes to protect their feet. And so as they ran, the people back in the village are waiting. They are watching. They are looking to see a figure in the distance coming to tell them, should we flee? They have packed a good part of their, their valuables and are prepared as a family to run to the nearest walled city or to another region away from the battle. As they watch off in the distance, they see a figure running as fast as he can run. The people in the valley or in the village are anxious. They are listening as hard as they can. What will he say? Will it be good news? Will it be bad news? And the voice comes back, victory, victory. And the people, when he arrives, look at his feet. They're filled with cuts, bruises, blisters, and covered with blood. But they are beautiful. How beautiful are the feet of those that bring good news. The Apostle John was a good runner. He outran Peter to the tomb. He looked inside and there was no body there. It was good news. Victory over sin. Victory over death. He later wrote the book of Revelation. If you study the book of Revelation, I guarantee you there will be a lot of things in it you don't understand. But know this, the overriding message of the book of Revelation is we have victory in our hands. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Good morning, Saturday Road. We have good news to tell, and we're going to sing it out this morning. So let's stand and sing together. There's a message true and glad for the sinful and the sad. Bring it out.
God, I pray that you bless the funds that will come this morning. Father, that people all around the world will hear the good news all the way on the other side of the globe and down the street from us. In your son's precious name, amen. Please be seated. How beautiful the hands that serve the white and the red of the sons of the earth. How beautiful the feet that walk the flowing roads and the hills to the cross. How beautiful. Each week, when we meet around the Lord's table, there, the person that is leading our thoughts usually tries to help each of us turn our thoughts away from the mundane, from the everyday things we may be concentrating on for the majority of the week, and to focus us, at least for that moment, on the significance of what happened on the cross almost 2,000 years ago. We may hear scripture concentrating on themes of Jesus' love, of his sacrifice, of the pain that he underwent for us. But the one that resonates the most with me today and one that you may not even have put in connection with this event is the theme of an ambassador. Jesus' message at that first Lord's Supper was of reconciliation, of participation in the Lord himself. He was God's holy ambassador to mankind and asked that his followers participate in that office of ambassador as well. On the Sunday where we're highlighting the great need to support missions work, this concept of being an ambassador seems certainly appropriate. Missionaries on a daily basis are true ambassadors of Christ, representing him to the world, spreading the good news, spreading the great news that sinners don't have to remain at distance from God. We, or anyone anywhere in the world, can become one 
with Christ. We can, by believing that he is the Son of God, we can accept his teachings, we can put him, his self, on us as we are baptized into his name. Missionaries are representing Christ to the nations and turning lives to Jesus every day. And we too are his representatives, his ambassadors in our own daily lives. So I said that leading, those leading the communion thoughts usually have a script to share, and I'm no different. I have one that I think um, is, is great to use today. And in general, Scripture being a message that is breathed into life by God's own Holy Spirit is certainly helpful as we think about our position as ambassador for Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us, each of us, my words, the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ, not counting men's trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And here's the portion of this passage that certainly applies to what we're about to do. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So let's join with the missionaries across the world in the job of being ambassadors for Christ, and also let's join Christians today around the world who are participating in Christ as we take this communion. Each of us who are enjoying the reconciliation that we have with God. We can be seen as righteous in God's sight, all because of what Christ has done for us. Let's pray for the bread. Dear Lord, we ask that you bless this bread that we take, along with Christians everywhere doing the same exact thing today. And let us remember how we have put your son on us, how we have clothed ourselves with him. We are his body, the church. We pray for blessings in our lives as ambassadors of yours. And it's in your son's name that we ask these things. Amen. Now let's have the prayer for the cup. Lord, please bless those who are today remembering the blood that was lovingly shed by your Son, our Savior. We're thankful that his blood, given once for all time and for all people, continues to cleanse us as Christians throughout the world. Thank you for the power that is in his blood to cleanse us from our sins, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen.
So real quick, if you are a guest this morning, we are so glad that you are here. And up on the screen, I believe, there's a list of classes that are offered here. And so if you're looking for a class to go to, we would love so once service is over, you see that some of the rooms are up here, but I know it's up here. So if you don't remember, once service is closed, this will be on the screen again. And then if you go out these doors and head towards the family center, there's a welcome area where someone can point you to the right. We love for everyone to stay for a class today. Children that are age three through kindergarten, this is your time to shine. You've got a children's church. If you are a guest, we would love for your kids, if they fall in a direct, to join us. And so y'all can head that way during this song, and after this song, we'll have our message. Christ for the world we see, the world to Good morning. If you are seated, we want to welcome you. If you are viewing from online, hot, 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 hot. We also want to welcome you to this uh, very special day because it is Sunday, Resurrection Day, but also because of what we are intended to do or to accomplish. And not us, rather, but God through us. I want to say welcome to Bennett Bell, who was baptized uh, this past weekend. Well, this is, yeah, it's the first, first day of the week, so yeah, this past weekend, yeah. And also Miss uh, Kalameda. I don't know, I'm not sure if she's here. Okay, but welcome to the body of Christ, and we are so happy that you are going to be journeying with us on the road to Zion. So good morning once again, and welcome to Harvest Sunday. It is the day that God has made, and we want to bring good news. We want to talk about the good news that continues to permeate the world through your hands, through your offerings, through your gifts. And as we seek to accomplish a task, uh, we want to talk about bringing God's presence. We want to talk about the God who is a missionary. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, we read... In the beginning was the Word, 
And the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. and We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. One of the most scandalous verses that you will read, one of the most scandalous verses ever written, word or logos from where we get our English word logic, was understood as the cosmic principle of reason or power that fashion that created and put sense into the world, water cycles and evaporation and things that, you know, are interdependent. The reason in the world, making order of chaos. Upon reading the text, we see this reason or logic that puts the world together as is described as being God, being with God, yet Coming into the created world, John says this Logos belongs with God and is responsible for the world. However, he is not separate and apart. He has distinction and otherness, but he is also near and involved. He is a missionary, and as you see this text, you focus on the words in yellow, with God, was God. He came as a witness, coming into the world, was in the world. He gave, the word became, his dwelling among us, son who came. And as you seek to summarize that understanding from John Spen, you come up with these words, one who was coming, dwelling, becoming, staying, presenting, giving, empowering. God is a missionary God. He's coming, he's arriving, but he's also inspiring and sending. He sends others, all missionaries follow the example of the coming God as you peer at the flags all around this place. All missionaries follow the example of God as they go in witness, not knowing all the language and the senses in which it is used, not being fully acclimated to the culture, to the environment, to the weather, to the foods. They sow in weakness and oftentimes what is, is seen as foolishness by the outside. But their goal, and this is the thesis for our lesson this morning, their goal is to present Christ, a picture of humility 
and patience and sacrifice. They try to clear a way for others to encounter God. They make way for his presence. So Ray's going to India. There are more people in India who have not heard Jesus than anywhere else on earth. Now, when they become a Christian from the Hindu religion, it's a very serious matter. They don't just become a Christian and everything goes on the same. They become a Christian, their whole life changes. I think that one of the values that comes from being a missionary, even a short term, but especially if you go and stay there, uh, would would be the concern about uh, your worldview. Your your worldview will change. Your life will change. If you go to the mission field, even on a short-term trip, you'll change your worldview. You'll have an impact on the number of people who need to hear Jesus and have not, and maybe will not, unless you go. I would recommend that you not only read or hear a mission trip report, but go on the mission. That'll make the difference. May God bless you. So John is telling us that God himself has come into this world and appropriated the stuff of this world. Jesus is not simply a human representing God, but the word that became flesh presented God, the point of contact where divine reality and creaturely life meet. In the beginning, the logic behind what you see in the world, what is the world, the cause and principle of cosmic reason responsible for creating, ordering, and putting shape and function into the world, that which allows reasonableness to perpetuate in the making of a pot in the making of a chair or even in the making of a broom. These things are reasonable. They have form, but they also have function. In the making of a pot, a chair, a broom, we see the remnants, we see the fingerprints, we see the blueprints of a God that cares for order and things that function and things that are meaningful. God came and he waited among us. God came. God is a missionary. God who is. God all powerful. God came in humility. God came presented in bodily form. Word, reason, logic. Embodied came making known in the going and in the waiting, the bringing of the presence of God. God is in the going, moving toward the other, submitting, sitting, listening, proving with life lived, intersecting hours, exposing us to who God is. God is a missionary, and he comes to us that we might present him to others. He sent prophets. He sent angels until he came himself. And he expects those he came to, to keep presenting him. And you ask, where is the miracle in that? Where is the dead raised in that? Where are the sicknesses healed in that? The miracle is in his coming, in staying with us, in bringing his presence the missionary God on assignment and so we have this task not to represent God per se not to misrepresent God but to present God John do you can you come up here for a sec please I know you was drinking but I caught you off guard but that's okay come on up if I were to be tasked to represent John. I wouldn't need John. Your name is John, right? Yeah. And the text is also John. So that's, that's cool. 
I wouldn't need John. I would need to know some things about him and talk to him maybe and then go up to myself and say, this is John. This is what he likes. This is what he dressed like. This is where he lives. This is who he's married to. I don't need John to represent John. Sometimes when you represent people, you don't get all your facts right. Sometimes you insert things that has nothing to do with them. We are not called to represent or to misrepresent. We are called to... We are called to present. So you don't get to speak. You don't get to control. You don't get to dictate. In presenting, you move him forward and you disappear. You are not called to represent as much as you are called to present. Thank you, John. That was higher, bro. That was higher. <laughs> In representing, you try to convince or coerce others to buy into what you think God wants based on your comprehensive grasp. And I always shudder when people use that word comprehensive. Comprehensive grasp and understanding of his word. In terms of presenting God, you call attention to the God who arrives and you patiently wait with others in the unfolding of his presence as you look and listen and seek, as you read a living word that has as much questions for you as you have for it. As you pray for discernment, as you wait for him, and as you speak and follow the revelation, in spite of your desire to rein it in and make it yours, we often follow our desire to not be missionaries, but to be spiritual colonizers and glory seekers. One day, uh, Paulus said, we need to go to my village where my mother-in-law is. It's up in the hill, foothills of the Drakensberg. And I noticed right away her legs from her knees down were swollen, almost as big as my thighs at that point. She was bubbling with enthusiasm. She sometimes used two sticks to walk, not just one, but she had boiled over with this joy and this enthusiasm as she met me. A few, day, a few weeks later, Paulus came to me and said, Brother Bill, Gogo wants to be baptized. He says, can you get us into the white church? Remember, this is the land of apartheid. I took it upon myself and we got Gogo in the back of my truck and with about four or five other men. And I went down to the church building. These four, four men took Gogo, put her in a metal folding chair, put her down into the water and they in Zulu and they performed all the ceremonies saying the words, they baptized her and pulled her up and then carried her back out. We cleaned the place up as best we could and we got into my church and as the Bible says about the Ethiopian eunuch, we went on our way rejoicing. Well, the next Sunday, because any Sunday that I was in town and wasn't out in, in Zululand somewhere, we went to church, always went to church there with the white congregation. We went, was in church after services were over, the elders pulled me over you brought blacks into our church. 
You brought blacks down into our baptistry. We had to drain it. We had to scrub it. And we had to clean it all. There was not a word of rejoicing about a person, a soul coming to know Jesus. But I'll never forget that. Some of the opposition came from my fellow Christians right there in that place. When Christ is not presented, someone or something else is. We present ourselves in the name of God. We misrepresent with our ideas, our thoughts, even our fears. We focus on individual. We focus on our institutional survival. How did they use the name and speak his will, not knowing he was among them? How can a creator come to his creation and they miss him? They're busy. They cannot wait on him and see the signs of his presence. They try to work it out to survive and to do and effect what they feel is necessary in the place. They ask questions of God, yet they supply their very own answers and do what they think is best. And then tell others, this is God's will, not knowing he had arrived. They preach a saving word not knowing he had arrived. They build churches and are busy in redeeming efforts, not knowing he had arrived. They build up churches based on class, not knowing he had arrived. They build up churches based on strategies, not knowing he had arrived. They build up churches based on number, based on separate water to save different bodies, not knowing he had arrived. And they put God's name on it. Not knowing that God does not live in temples constructed by man and his vain imagination seeking inauthentic piety and human glory. God's arrival is not always caught by his disciples because they are so caught up in being the star of the story that they miss him like a nameless extra on the set of life. But God is a missionary and he comes to his own he brings his holy presence so we could recognize and yearn for true love and true life so that we could see and feel and taste in his waiting with us serving us with his presence but for those who cannot sit still and wait or recognize the blooming of his presence God's presence is never enough. His name is invoked to merchandise and colonize and coerce a success story. We figure out a plan and build a legacy for our glory. We are missionaries of our own devices sometimes, always working, always doing, always busy doing good work. But it's not for the glory of God. So God comes to his own, but his own does not recognize him. They represented what they defined as him. They misrepresented him and did not present him. And so in Luke chapter 10, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, you know, who sat at the Lord's feet, waiting, listening to what he said. But the scripture says, Martha was distracted by all the preparations that just had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, you don't care that my sister has left me to do all this work by myself. Tell her to help me. Then Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are worried, you are fearful, you are upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. In the onslaught of words, Lord, Lord, let my sister help me. 
He says, Martha, you need to put that broom down. You need to put that pot down. Your sister stopped trying to fix up the house and attend to her work. And she looked up and she sat still for my arrival. She looked at me. She acknowledged my presence. She chose better. Better. His presence is coming. So much work to do, so many things to fix, so many holes to patch. God says, be still and know that I am God. So busy working out our salvation and survival in the name of God that we don't even look up to see or experience his arrival or to be the presenters, the pointers like John. John testified concerning him. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confess freely, I am not, sir. I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not, sir. Are you the prophet? No. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied, in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. Clear a path so that he can arrive. He is coming. And the next day, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, look, he's pointing, he's heralding, he's announcing the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Drop down to verse 35. And the next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. Over and over again, John is pointing when asked, Who are you, man? Who are you? I am a narrator. I am an announcer. I am a pointer. John could have said, I'm the guy. And then reply with his wisdom. But John resists the glory and the answer from his wisdom and says, Now, may I present to you the undisputed, the unconquerable, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the Christ. And he moves, he vanishes. People don't like that. People don't like that because in order to announce, they have to be front and center. And they have to think through it and give it language and give it body. And John says, all I have to do is to clear away so that you can arrive. May I present to you. I did a wedding ceremony earlier on for um, Kate and Will, Mr. and Mrs. Hughes. And I found it so blessed after I talked about, you know, the power that the state has given me to pronounce them man and wife. As they left, everyone was not focusing on me. They were focused on the bride and groom that were presented for the first time ever in any place, in any galaxy. Man and wife walking through the celebration, the, the, the joy was fixated on them with cheers and hooray and smiling and cheers. No one wanted to see the preacher. No one came to see the preacher. They came to see the bride. They came to see the groom. That was just presented. John says, I am not the guy that you're looking for. Every opportunity John has as he's waiting with other people. He's not by himself. He has disciples. But even they know that he's not the boss, that he's not the one that they're waiting on to arrive. 
Every opportunity John has, he is waiting for the people, speaking into people. John finds a way to present Christ as he's coming, as he's arriving. This idea of presenting, John says, I am not the light. I am introducing the light. And as he finished his work, Christ came. He says, I'm only here to make his paths straight. Call your attention to him as he recedes into the background. So he can do his work with those that are still seeking, still open to the miracle of his coming, still open to the miracle of his presence, not motivated by survival, by things, or by more resources to feel safe and secure, but minded to break the alabaster box of perfume and anoint his presence with everything we hold dear. Losing life, we gain his arrival. God is a missionary. He brings his presence to those who can still sit, still gaze upon his aura and bask in the presence, always knowing that it is enough. This is the eulogy for uh, Eugene Peterson written by his son, Leif. It's almost laughable how you fooled them, how for 30 years every week you made them think you were saying something new. They thought you were a, you were a magician in your long black robe, hiding so much up your ample sleeves and always pulling something fresh and making them think it was just for them. They didn't know how simple it all was. They were blind to your secret, only saw the magic you performed, how you made the mysterious, the ominous, the holy into a cup of coffee, how you made a cup of coffee into an act of grace. You got this new group fooled into thinking you're worth millions. <laughs> They're printing it on t-shirts, coffee mugs, message pads, a new version every week for some new flock. Now you're fooling them all over the world in churches, schools, homes, and prisons. It's so funny. Only my inheritance keeps me from giving you away. I alone know what you've been doing, how you fooled them all, taking something so simple something a child could understand and making it into a career, a vocation, an empire. I know. Because for 50 years, you've been telling me the secret. For 50 years, you've stealed into my room at night and whispered softly to my sleeping head. It's the same message over and over, and you don't vary it one bit. God loves you. He's on your side. He's coming after you. He's relentless. May you let God find and use you to fulfill his purpose in your life. He's coming after you. He is relentless. And to dance and entertain a God of such magnitude, you understand that sometimes your, your dreams are not big enough. When announced, God arrives. He effects what he wants. Overseas and at home in mission as we wait, as we expect. Waiting is the Disposition of those who expect God to act. No coercion, no manipulation, no busy work, no busyness, no more programs. It is the disposition of those who use God's name to support their efforts of thriving and survival. It has nothing to do with human effort. And so we want to raise $600,000 for missions. We are not a rich church, as I've been reminded earlier. 
but we are praying into the will of God who is and still comes, allowing us to do the impossible. So God could bring a story in so deep and so wide that we pledge out the door to raise even more than $600,000. He's been working on hearts and sitting with souls and nudging people. I dare say we meet the goal and more. Yet whatever the Lord desires and wills, will come to fruition, whether we fight it or not, whether we aid and abet it or not. But the best thing is to go with the nudging and go with the arrival of the king who has partnered with you to preach the gospel. You didn't need a sermon this morning to bring that forth. You just needed to raise your head and your heart long enough to catch his arrival and acknowledge his working in and around you. Whatever he wills for overseas and for local, we will accomplish. So $600,000 plus is coming for foreign missions. Thy will be done, Lord, but we need another currency for local missions. Uh, one brother uh, this week reminded me that we needed to raise the currency of consciousness for local missions, a currency that is deposited into the hearts of those that wait on the quickening brought by a living God acting on the core of our being. God is a missionary. He comes and he waits not willing that any should perish, Peter tells us, but that all should come unto repentance. He waits and partners with people to bring his presence, and they are not his presence. They bring his presence. They don't represent his presence. They announce his presence. They point, they herald, but make no mistake, they are not the star of the show. I think all too often when you look around, churches and individuals and bodies are wanting to be the star of the show. They want to figure things out and force things and accomplish things. And God is still saying, if you just clear the way, I will arrive. God is actively saving seekers in the world. And we often say, God is out to just judge the world. But might I remind you that the Bible also says, judgment begins at the house of God. Those that are called by his name who are supposed to get out of the way. Those who should know what it is to wait on God and feel his presence. If we do not recognize or even dare to lift our eyes to acknowledge his coming or lift our hands from the tools of our work and individual strength to bring forth our own progress and safety and security in our institution, then we are already judged. If we cannot look up, but God is good. God is a missionary. God will be announced. He will be presented by us or in spite of us. God will arrive with us present or in our perpetual absence. So let's land this missionary plane. Um, some of us don't know the coming of God's presence. So we don't know even within ourselves, how to be present. Not with ourselves, and not with anybody else. I mean, you cannot teach what you have not learned, and you cannot share what you have not experienced. So as we continue with the missionaries in the field, announcing God's presence, we need to start with the persons here on this soil, in our bodies. That soul, we have needs to submit to God. Who is God 
who is. Not who was, but God who is. You need to learn to be present for the person next to you. To learn to be present for the person across the street. We go across the waters to build a legacy, but sometimes we refuse to go across the street to share a testimony. We cannot just want their confession and not their presence. That's making merchandise of people. So as we think of the God who arrives, we cannot provide goods and services in exchange for confession. As we think of the God who arrives, we cannot own the stories of people to build our legacy based on them being products that we steward in the name of God. Doing works, doing and doing, instead of reflecting and waiting and contemplating with people. God is a missionary. And this went against docetism. The idea that Christ could never have been human because if he's connected with God, they are wholly apart and separate from creation. So what you saw was more of a phantom or hologram. Christ just seemed to be human. But John tells you that he was real. He came in the flesh because God is concerned with bringing reality, not just appearance. God pitched his tent among us and showed us what it means to dwell with each other and bless life by engagement and relationship. And ironically, some argued that God was so high, he couldn't be human. So the question comes, was he really human? But that's the wrong question. As the theologian Andrew Root reminds us, the real question would be, not was Christ really human? But are we? Are we really human? Having seen who Christ was, having seen who God is, are we really a good image of this humanity? And the resounding answer is no. So we become missionaries through grace. Sent to announce the arrival of this grace. Sent to announce and point to present God. And this witness is lost whenever we present ourselves. So here's the gist, the zeitgeist. This is a nice German word for you. We support people to point to God, to announce his coming to announce his arrival, to unearth the everyday miracle that if people would see, they would believe and their hearts would turn. We're not looking for a parting of the ocean. We're not looking for the raising of the dead. We are looking for an everyday God for everyday people. So raise your head. Raise your heart. Put down your plowshares and put down your rakes and put down your tools and your ingenuity and your strategy and wait and listen and follow a God who is constantly arriving. But sometimes we're so flustered, we're so busy trying to work out our own salvation. We miss it. And I'm not saying that. John says he came to his own but his own did not recognize him. And as we live and breathe, may it never be said of the body that got us here at Saturn Road that when God came, we were so busy, so wrapped up in managing our decline, so wrapped up in bringing the programs and the young adult things that would bring everybody back, so wrapped up in trying to make it work, we missed a working God constantly arriving, 
among us who was rebuilding the things that we thought we had lost. Yeah. Two challenges is laid at your feet this morning. Number one, raise your head and listen to the arriving God so that this $600,000 thing, we can take care of it. That's the easiest thing for this morning. This thing is not hard for people who expect and who have felt and who have been nurtured by an arriving God. But if you don't believe in that, then that's a mountain. If you don't believe in that, then why give? If you have not been ministered to by an arriving God, then keep your monies and your checkbooks in your pockets and give to a decaying need. Number two, fuse the expectation of foreign missions with local missions. Understand that as we allow people to go point and announce in Africa and Asia, which we should wholly continue, Ray said, you need to take a mission trip. You need to go to Africa. You need to go to Asia. But you also need to go across the street. We don't choose one or the other. We do both. Because we are missionaries blessed by the grace of God to attend to his arrival. Stand to your feet, please. As we get ready to sing into the hearing of God and angels and those present and those absent, understand that you are not here for you to present yourself, your thoughts, your ideas, your abilities. We know the track record of man. I know my track record, and I'm not betting anything on me or on what I could bring to the table. God has already set a table. God has already taken care of our needs and our wants and our fears. And he says, all you need to do as Christians, all you need to do as people who bear my name is to do what John did. Lose your life so you can find it. Lose their life so somebody else could find it in him. Stop trying to fit a size 10 in a size 6. Stop trying to misrepresent God. But what you think is truth. Stop trying to represent God with your words, with your ability, with your character, and with a mix. Last time I checked, one pound of poison in 100 pounds of cornmeal was how much pounds of poison? hundred, right? Yeah. So don't mix. Present God. Get out of the way. If you need a revelation, if you need an appointment with an arrival, you've come to the right place. We don't have the answer. We are not stewards. But we know that as we pray and as we wait, he's on his way. Will you join him as we sing? The splendor of the king,
Good morning. Uh, I have a note here from uh, Jesse Walker. Uh, Jesse's uh, uh, a part is part of our facilities team. He works part time for us on Saturday and Sunday and Wednesday night. Uh, if you're not familiar with Jesse, but he presented this note. Thank you for all the love, cards, phone calls, food, and visits provided for my wife's passing. I send the biggest thank you from my son and Melissa's family. We felt all of the outpouring of love that you showed. We thank you and love you for that. Uh, I find this conference congregation continues to, uh, excuse me, uh, show the mission that, the mission of presence that Robbie preached about this morning. Your presence is important during difficult times, during times of celebration. Uh, it's through your, your food, your prayers, your phone calls, your texts, that you demonstrate the presence of God in, in times of trouble for families. Thank you. Hello. All right. Good morning, church. Um, I am um, just coming before you this morning. Our brother, uh, Adam Robinson, has come, come, come forward this morning. And um, he's, he's hurting deeply this morning. And uh, I don't think that very many people know the struggles that, that Adam has in his life, but he's just coming forward this morning because he just needs prayer for hope. And I'm just asking that you all would just love on him this morning and just join, uh, pray for him and also join me in prayer as we pray for Adam. Father in heaven, we love you so much, and we just thank you to God for uh, the blessing of life that you give us each and every day. Father, we're just so thankful for, for Adam and for the life that you've allowed him to live, Heavenly Father, and just for giving him the strength, Heavenly Father, to be able to continue to come when it's so hard for him, Heavenly Father. Be with Adam, dear God. Touch his heart. Help him, Heavenly Father, to have the hope in your son, Jesus, Father. Help us to be the body, a body that will just embrace him, Heavenly Father, and to help him in every way that we can, Heavenly Father. And for those demons that he's battling, Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would just remove those from his, his life, Heavenly Father, from his heart, and give him strength, Heavenly Father, for his days. We love Adam so much, Heavenly Father, we love you, and we just ask that you would be with him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I come with mixed emotions with this, uh, this next announcement. Uh, this is uh, a resignation letter from our, our very own Jack Titlow. Um, after, after almost 30 years of service, he has uh, decided to resign from his, uh, his role from benevolence, but also uh, he and Virginia are going to be leaving Saturn Road. So today will be his last day, and uh, I just wanted to offer a special prayer for Jack. And please forgive me, I'm going to have to go back to Jack and, and Virginia to offer this prayer. So, Jack, I just want to thank you so much for your service here for all, all these years. You know, it's been a pleasure to be able to serve with you. It has been. You're a good man. Yeah. Just let you know that we, we love you so much. And church, um, Jack has decided to leave because they've moved out to fate, and uh, his, his grandchildren and great-grandchildren are over at the East Ridge Church of Christ, so they will be placing membership there. Today is their last day here, but we just want to let them know we love them so much and just offer this prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for just the blessing of this day, Heavenly Father, and, and all that it brings. We're so thankful, Heavenly Father, for the relationship that we've been able to endure with, with Jack and Virginia and all of his family, Heavenly Father. Um, again, Father, it's uh, really uh, hurt, um, hurt, hurt for us, Heavenly Father, to, to see them go, Heavenly Father, but we're just so grateful, Heavenly Father, that you've given him this opportunity to be able to be with his family and to be able to continue to serve and, and lead them in a very special way. And we're just praying, Heavenly Father, for your continued grace to be upon Jack and his family as they go and, and worship and serve at Eastridge, that that congregation will be blessed as we have been here at Saturn Road, and that you would just bless their entire family, Heavenly Father, richly. 
We love you so much, and we give you the highest praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's come to my attention that uh, some of the pledge cards didn't get put out um, for those to pick up that need one. But if you need a pledge card, uh, we sent some in the mail. But if you still need one, we have ushers that have pledge cards and just raise your hand and they'll give you a pledge card. I want you to know that I'm just one of 14 committee members on the missions committee. And I'd like to have the other 13 members that are here, please stand. If you have, thank you. We are, we are in co communication with our missionary partners around the world. And if you have a question about anything, you can talk to me, you can talk to one of our other members and we'll be glad to uh, um, let you know whatever you need to know. We did send out a, a uh, packet in the mail to you. Uh, it had uh, some very colorful information for you. And we have some extra of those in the back and at the kiosk at the Welcome Centers. So you can grab one extra one of those if you need so. Just to bring you back quickly about where we were last year, this is a marathon. This is not a one-time thing. It's a marathon for the whole year. We started out last year on October 17th, and we had, um, we had 140 families that gave cash. And as you see, we had 271,000 given in cash by these 140 families. And then over the following year, we had more than 70 families that gave to pledges. And then we gave, had another 80 families that just gave. No pledge, just gave. And so God was moving in this congregation. And with over 300 families participating, it truly was a congregational effort and I want you to see the results. God was moving. Here are the results. And on behalf of the, our missionary partners, the shepherds, and the missions committee, we want to thank you for such an awesome, generous response. And this, this includes funding 40000 for our regular budget. Harvest is not a part of the regular budget. So we have to have money for the regular budget, all of the great ministries we have around Saturn Road. We need 40,000, so that's taking away from at the very top uh, to fund those um, uh, ministries. And so then after the 40,000, the rest is for local, as well as foreign missions. Like I say, there are two ways to, on pledging, there are two ways to pledge. There's the card, we still have the cards, but to make it easier for those at home, those that may not have cards available to them, you can just email me. I've already received, I'd say 13 or 14 emails this week of people pledging. Uh, if you already have an ongoing pledge on a, on a weekly, a monthly basis, I need to know that so that I know what it is. If you're making changes to your pledge, keeping it the same. We all have different financial changes in our lives. Um, some may not be able to pledge right now. Some may not be able to give right now. But the door is always open for the next 12 months for you to give. So don't let that stop you. It's, as you see, we had over, over 80 families that gave after Harvest Sunday without even pledging last year. So don't let that stop you, that you don't have a card or that your financial situation 
doesn't allow you to give right now. We understand that. Um, if you need help with giving, uh, Angie sent out an email about giving and how to give. Um, and I can help you with that, or uh, Angie can help you with that. Uh, just be sure you note that it is for missions and not the, the general fund. Let's pray for the harvest, okay? Our Father in God, we want to say we love you, that you are awesome, that you work in our lives more than we, more than we know. And we thank you for blessing our lives and allowing us to be instruments in spreading your word around the world. We pray that you'll be with the new Harvest Collection beginning today and that you'll give us the vision to understand your plan for us in reaching the lost. We ask a special prayer for our missionary partners who are still facing the residual impact of COVID around the world, being hungry, without jobs, and are trying to help their own congregations to survive. Give them strength, Father, and comfort as they boldly, boldly proclaim your word. We are so thankful for your son who gave his life to redeem us that we might be adopted as your children. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
across the street, and those going across the world. Pray for their courage and safety and peace and the power of the Spirit and spread. We want to remind everyone as well that we have class and we would love for everyone to stay. And we remind those that are guests where you can find the classes up on the street and the kiosk out of the family center. Have a wonderful week.